Okay, our main presentation is by uh, Dr. Tom O'Brien. Um, Dr. O'Brien is going to be um, discussing uh, the, uh, the, um, the autoimmune conditions, and there's a uh, book he's recently come out with uh, called The Autoimmune Fix. Um, Dr. Tom O'Brien is an internationally recognized speaker and writer on chronic disease and metabolic disorders. He is considered the world expert on the impact of wheat sensitivity on autoimmunity. In 2013, he organized the Gluten Summit, which I'm sure a lot of you may recall us mentioning here and um, encouraging you to uh, um, visit that. Um, it was the first internet gathering of more than 25 experts on celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. He is a member of the teaching facility at the Institute for Functional Medicine and author of The Autoimmune Fix. More information can be found on his website, www.thedr.com. So with that, I'd like us to give a very warm welcome to Dr. Tom O'Brien. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I opened my practice on, in Chicago on Valentine's Day in 1982. And we had a um, grand opening. And uh, it was on a Sunday. Um, and we had 350 people that came that day to our grand opening. And so um, I had students from the local college that were there doing blood pressures and a number of different things. But the uh, women who were helping take names and guide people around, they were so happy that we were opening our practice, they had formed a group two years earlier called Nutrition for Optimal Health Association, NOAA. And uh, they were bringing in speakers every month like you do. Uh, so I cut my teeth on this type of an organization. Um, I was launched by this type of an organization in Chicago. So it's really a pleasure to be here. I know that everyone here is here because you want to learn cutting edge, more information to be healthier. So I'm gonna do my best for you. Um, I think I have about 185 slides for you. It's, it's a bit of a Zoom Zoom evening. Um, and uh, I'll just get started. So I'm very grateful to be here. I truly am. It's, uh, uh, this, is where, this is where I started, is in this kind of a format. Um, so we're going to take a trip. You know, we're we're going to go for a little ride. And um, this article just came out about six weeks ago, maybe eight weeks ago. And it was in the 1950s that a group of what were considered renegade medical doctors had discovered that if you prick the back, and if you have a little bit of a substance on the needle and you prick the back, and if you get a red circle of, of a little bit of inflammation right around the point where you prick the back with that substance, you got a problem with that substance. And it was the first test that had some concrete scientific evidence behind it for allergies. And so a whole group of medical doctors decided to focus on this. It really turned them on, and they focused on it. And a discipline developed called allergists. There were no allergists before the mid-50s. But now there was a whole field of discipline called allergists. Um, when there's interest in a field, oncology, medical oncology is less than 50 years old. Well, cancer has been around for a long time, but the specialty of oncology is only 50 years old. The specialty of geriatrics, the board certification just began in 1988. You know, so that as more technology comes out, as our healthcare practitioners learn more, some of them focus on this area and help to accelerate the development of that particular area. That's the way that we move forward in healthcare. Well, there is a discipline now that has just come out called autoimmunology. So it's a specialty within the field of the immune system, the autoimmune system. 
It's so prevalent now and it's so important that many doctors are saying, there's so much to learn here. I, I could develop a specialty in this. And that's what's happening. If you look at the number of medical papers in the field of autoimmunology from 1996 up to 2016, it's tripled. So in 20 years, it's tripled. The number of research papers coming out every month on the topic. This is not a fringe topic. What you're gonna to learn tonight is that the autoimmune mechanism is at the foundation of almost every degenerative disease. We think that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of getting sick and dying in the world. But cardiovascular disease is autoimmune. I'll show you the studies. Autoimmune in its initiating phases and fueling it to continue. It's autoimmune. So why is our immune system causing atherosclerosis? Why is our immune system causing Alzheimer's? Why is our immune system causing Parkinson's or rheumatoid or MS? There is so much science now on this topic that there's a whole field of discipline that's developed, the autoimmunologists. And they have four conferences a year. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And these are the countries where most of the research papers are coming out. So the US, Brazil, uh, Europe, uh, India, uh, Russia, Australia. That's where most of the research on autoimmunity is coming out. And what do those countries have in common? They're all industrialized countries, and they all are very toxic countries. More and more air pollution, more and more water pollution. Uh, that these are the countries that have the most, in general, the most increase in environmental toxins. And I'm gonna show you the connection. Oh, did I say Russia? That's China, yeah. right? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, my mistake, sorry. So how many of you know or suspect that you currently may have an autoimmune mechanism going on? Can I see? How many people here? Oh, that's great, that's great. Uh, so of course, that's what the talk's about tonight. Well, um, we're going to talk about where it comes from, what's the trigger? Where does this thing come from? So I've got a few premises that I'm going to give you. First one, if autoimmune disease is such a growing field, why is there such a delay in recognizing its manifestations? Why does that happen? And, well, oh, by the way, my format, well, first I'll answer the question, it takes an average of 17 years from the time the research is published before the doctor down the street is using that information in their practice. 17 years from when they published research on cholesterol may have something to do with cardiovascular disease before the doctor down the street was testing cholesterols. 17 years. So autoimmunology is just getting its birth right now if we follow that trend, how long is it gonna be before every doctor will consider an autoimmune mechanism for the patients coming in complaining of chronic disease? It's gonna be years and years and years and years. Well, not on my watch. That that's my job, that's my, my purpose in life is to bring this topic out to um, more common knowledge, which is why I'm here. And my format for the evening and in all my talks this is the research paper I read. It's the front page of the paper. This is the medical journal, the date, the page numbers, and all of that. And these are exact quotes from the authors. They're the exact quotes from the researchers. Now, if something's in parentheses, it's mine. I added something. But if it's not in parentheses, it's the exact words from the researchers. Right? And you have to remember, these guys are geeks. They are not English majors. So they're trying to tell us something here, but they, they're, and you'll see some of their language is very clear. They're saying, hey, wake up to the, wake up, wake up. So why the resistance? Why 17 years? Well, take the best information from clinical trials and observational studies and apply the results in clinical practice. What in medicine could be more rational or straightforward? Right? Why is there such resistance? Why do things take so long? I'm gonna give you an example. In the United States, cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease prevalence in the general population is expected to reach 40%, with direct related costs set to reach $800 billion a year in the next two decades. In Europe, it's 47% of all deaths, four million fatalities, 196 billion euros a year. Yet, despite a rich evidence base for management of cardiovascular disorders, Study after study 
has demonstrated disconcertingly low rates of compliance with widely disseminated evidence-based treatment guidelines. Study after study says, here's the science, it's obvious, but it's not being complied to. I'm gonna give you an example here. And this is both in a group like this, most of you have heard, how many of you know that there are different types of HDL cholesterol and different types, yeah, in this group, of course, of course. So uh, it's called lipid subfractionation. There's, Mrs. Patient, there's, who says LDL is bad cholesterol? Are you kidding me? LDL is the raw material that estrogen comes from and testosterone and melatonin and serotonin and insulin. They're all made from LDL cholesterol and stress hormones. They're all made from LDL cholesterol. Is that bad cholesterol? No, but oxidized LDL, when the LDLs get damaged, that's nasty stuff. But LDL is not. But we, we are thinking, most of our doctors, if they're gonna look for a risk of cardiovascular disease, they check your cholesterol, your HDL, and your LDL. That test is 34 years old. But that's what they use to see if you're at risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, here's the next statistic. 50% of people in the United States that die of a first heart attack, 50% of them don't have high cholesterol. So if the only test you're doing is to see if you have high cholesterol, but, and that's important for 50% of the population, but the other 50% of the population, it doesn't tell you anything because you don't have high cholesterol and you still can have a fatal first heart attack. But 30, 30 some years ago, that's all we knew was total cholesterol, HDLs, and LDLs. That's all we knew, but that's 30 plus years old. Now we know, Mrs. Patient, there's different types of HDL cholesterol. There's six different types of HDL cholesterol. One type, uh, the main one, it acts like a scrub brush. It cleans your pipes. It's really good for you. And the other main type, though, it's a hitchhiker along for the ride. And a couple studies have shown that that cholesterol, that HDL cholesterol actually can plug up your pipes. Well, wait, it's HDL. Read the studies. If you have too much of the wrong type of HDL cholesterol, you plug up your pipes. So if you're only looking at the total cholesterol and the HDLs and the LDLs and those ratios look good, you're misled into believing that you're safe. Your cholesterol to HDL ratio is good, that you're safe. No, maybe you're safe. But if your HDLs are mostly the hitchhikers, it's misleading. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So how many people here have done a lipid subfractionation? Now, almost 80% of the room raised their hand the first time that they know about it, but only four people raised their hand that they've done the test. Insurance doesn't cover it. We'll put that on your gravestone. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. I can't even go to my HMO and get the test made. I understand. I understand. It's 60 bucks copay to have a lipid subfractionation. 60 bucks. So if your doctor orders it and you bill the insurance, they'll pay a portion, but they don't pay the whole thing. You have to pay 60 bucks. And this is what we think is the number one cause of getting sick and dying in the world but we're only doing the tests that insurance will pay for that misses half the population that drops dead from a heart attack. That's the resistance that we're up against. You, you get that? We rationalize not doing what we know we should do, that it's not gonna break the bank to do it, and you, know, you do it once, and if it comes back no problems, you do it every three, five years. If it comes back a problem, you got a problem. Mrs. Patient, the LDL cholesterols, there's the large buoyant ones. They're like tumbleweeds rolling across the plains. If they bump up against you, it's no big deal. But then there's a small dense one. They're like octopus tentacles <laughs> grabbing on the inside of your blood vessels. But the force of the bloodstream breaks them off and they keep going down the bloodstream, but the suction cups stay there and they go down into your blood vessels. That causes the plugging up of your pipes. Your immune system attacks that an autoimmune mechanism attacks that, and that starts the atherosclerotic process. So if you've got a high percentage of small, dense LDLs, you've got a problem. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. But we don't do the test. I started doing that test in 1996. <laughs> That's when it came out, 1996. 
that test. And we started right away in functional medicine using that test. So let's just move on. So we'll just go past all that. 17 years, that's the average, 17 years. So you need to be educated. And you need to be educated and you need to put your rational mind aside, trying to say, well, but insurance won't pay for it. Just put all that aside and just listen to the information to determine what you need to do for yourselves. So the American Autoimmune Related Disease Association tells us there's over 100 autoimmune diseases. There's almost 300 autoimmune conditions, 100 named diseases, just over 100. It can affect any tissue in your body. There is no tissue, it can't, except I don't know about an autoimmune disease specifically of the fingernails. That I don't know. There may be one. I don't know of that. Aside from that, any other tissue of your body may be affected. Autoimmune disease diagnosis takes an inordinate amount of time and perseverance by the patient. Look at the years to diagnosis in 96, and look at 2013. The number of physicians to see to get a diagnosis, six different physicians. The number that were told it was all in their head. Look at the years to diagnosis for specific conditions. Sjogren's, 4.3 years. Rheumatoid, 2.7 years. MS, 3.2 years. The number of doctors seen to get a diagnosis. How many doctors do you have to see to get the diagnosis of the autoimmune disease that you've got? Percent told their disease was imagined or they were overly concerned. Over half of them. Well, it's all in your head, Mrs. Patient. You're fine. Your blood test is fine. And that's because they're doing the wrong tests. Why so long and difficult to get a correct diagnosis? Physician education was identified as a contributing factor. The AARDA did a survey of family physicians. What did they find? In medical school, how much training in autoimmune disease did you receive? 27.8% of them had two lectures. 18.5% had one lecture. That's one lecture, not one course. One lecture. This is the training that your doctors have received and you expect them to know what to do. Would you agree you received enough training to diagnose and treat autoimmune diseases? 32% disagree. 12.3% are neutral. 6.2% no, are neutral. 12.3% somewhat disagree. 29% strongly agree. So one out of three doctors um, feel they, they got enough training. Yeah, I, I had two courses. That's enough. Right? What's your level of comfort in diagnosing autoimmune disease? 50% of them are very uncomfortable. 50% of them. It's unfair to expect our classically trained physicians to know of this platform and demand they change. It's unfair of us to demand they change. They don't know the problems there. They don't know. They don't know. When you read that book, you will know more than your physician. I promise. If you don't, I'll give you your money back. You know. I make $2.12 on each book. You know. This is not about the money. You know, this is, and I, I have been very embarrassed to say anything, but I don't care anymore. People die from not knowing this. When you know this, you will ask different questions. You will ask very different questions of yourself when you look at your lifestyle, of your environment, of your doctors. You'll ask different questions because you'll have more knowledge. Premise number two. We have to wake up and up our game in how we look. Thank you. In how we look at our predicament. We, gotta, we have to up the game. Why do I say that? We have to wake up. <laughs> wake up. The problems we've created today cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created the problem. We all have to change the way we think about health care. And you, you know, I'm speaking to the, to the choir here right, uh, in many ways, but I hope I have an impact for you and you learn some new things tonight also. This came out six months, five months ago. Anyone read this? No? I read a, there was a little article on page eight of the New York Times as I was flying home from Austin one day, and I said, oh, that's too bad, and I went on to the next page. And then um, I got back to the airport, I live in San Diego, got back to the airport, Went out to the parking lot, got in the car, started driving home. I'm on the freeway. I almost hit the brakes. I said, wait a minute. 
wait a minute, did I just read that? And I'm so numb to this, like you're going to be numb. To, well, I'm, my job is to make sure you're not numb to this. But the, um, the World Wildlife Fund published this study in conjunction with two major universities. They looked at 3,748 species and 18,296 populations of mammals on the planet. What did they find? There has been, on average, a 58% loss in abundance between 1970 and 2012 of everything that lives on the planet. In 42 years, the average is 58% of everything is gone. Except us. Well, I'll get to us. <laughs> and it, the, the trends differed in the different ecosystems. For the terrestrials, the birds, it was 38% average loss. The Baltimore Orioles, the Red Robins, the Woodpeckers, the Owls. The average is 38% of them are gone. Marines, it's 36%, but fresh water is 75%. Why? They're drinking the water. If you drink the water coming out of the streams, right by your house or a mile away from where you live, you're going to get cancer quicker, and you're going to be unable to reproduce quicker, just like the mammals. It's the toxic environment, what we're doing. Every newborn child in the US today, on average, has 186 toxic chemicals in their bloodstream at birth that aren't supposed to be there. Every child, they check. Every child. We have to wake up. For the first time in the history of the human species, this has never happened before to humans, ever. The New England Journal of Medicine tells us that children born today have a shorter projected lifespan than their parents. They're going to get sick at an earlier age, diagnosed with diseases at earlier ages, and die at an earlier age than when their parents die. We have to wake up. We filter our water, so we're just getting minute dosages of all these toxins compared to the animals. They're just getting straight hits. But we're getting the same exposures. It's killing us off, too. It's just going to be a little bit slower. Where does, so, prep, so that's it on, about waking up. We have to wake up. We have to wake up. I do a whole half hour on just waking up with statistic after statistic after statistic when I've got my uh, doctors for a full day. I do eight-hour presentations with them. These are the docs that want to get certified. Now, I've got about 650 docs now around the world that really understand this, really understand it. So where does autoimmunity initiate? The classical paradigm of how autoimmune disease begins involving a specific gene. You know what? If, if you've got a gene, it doesn't mean you're going to get that disease. It means you're vulnerable to that disease. Mrs. Patient, if you pull at a chain, the chain breaks at the weakest link. It could be at one end, the middle, the other end, the heart, the brain, the liver, the kidney, wherever your genetic weak link is, that's where the chain's going to break if you pull too hard. Does that make sense to you? Your genes determine where the weak link is. It's your genes, and it's called antecedents, how you've lived your life. You eat tuna a couple times a week every week, you got high mercury. That weakens the chains. Every tuna that you eat now has mercury in it. Every one, except um, Vital Choice Seafood, and if you buy their canned tuna fish. Because Randy Hartnell, who owns Vital Choice Seafood, he was a uh, salmon fisherman in Alaska. 25 years ago, he decided, I really want to get this information out to the world about how healthy these fish are. So they got four families. They pulled themselves together, and Randy had his co-captain or something run the sh his boat, and he started the marketing. So they're an online fish supply house, and they give you, and what they notice is that when, when you catch salmon, sometimes you get tuna in there also with the salmon, right? And the baby, and so they get, sam, they get tuna, great, let's, let's just sell the tuna. But they get baby tuna, and they can't do anything with the baby tuna. They have to throw them away. Randy figured out, let's take the, the belly of the baby tuna, let's look at that meat. There's no mercury, or there's almost no mercury in that meat, because there's young baby fish. They haven't accumulated the mercury yet. So you want tuna fish for your kids? You get vital choice tuna. Does that make sense? That's in the book. There's all kinds of little tricks like that in the book, little things to help. So involving a specific genetic makeup, exposure to environmental triggers. But now this classical paradigm of where autoimmune disease comes from, genes and environment, the questions on environment, there it is, whether it's heavy metals or bacteria or parasites or food sensitivities or the air you breathe, they all can trigger autoimmunity. Vaccines, they all can trigger it. 
has been challenged by the addition of a third element, the loss of your intestinal barrier function. And this is the take home slide. The autoimmune process can be arrested. This is their words. This is from Harvard. You can arrest the autoimmune process if you heal your gut. Because the gut is the, uh, the, the gateway into the development of autoimmune diseases. Heal the gut, you stop the environmental toxins getting into the system, you stop that whole pulling on the chain, the inflammatory cascade. So that's really the take home, and there's so much more to know, but that's the take home message. You can arrest the development of autoimmune disease by healing the gut. Dale Bredesen, how many know of Dr. Bredesen? Some of you do, has he been here? Yeah, he has, sure. Dale Bredesen published in November of 2014 in the journal Aging, reversing Alzheimer's in nine out of 10 patients at UCLA. He runs the Buck Institute at UCLA. Completely reversing Alzheimer's in nine out of 10 people. Now that was 2014, he did his first um, weekend course for doctors about three months ago, and there were 300 of us in the room. Now he's got over 100 case studies, reversing Alzheimer's. There's 37 things on the checklist. Do they have gluten sensitivity? Do they have dairy sensitivity? Do they walk every day? Do they get eight plus hours of sleep a night? Do they have inflammation and all the different marks of inflammation? Ba -ba 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 -ba. And you just fix what you find. You fix this, you fix this, you fix this, you fix this. That's how you fix your brain. There's never going to be a pill that you can take to get better brain function long term. You can, you can put nitro down there, you know, and get your brain working better for a little bit, like two cups of coffee. You know, there's nutrition that will help, but you keep throwing gasoline on the fire, you keep having inflammation, you, the mechanism continues. Every degenerative disease, every one of them, as far as I know, at the cellular level is always a disease of inflammation. At the cell level, it's always inflamed, always. So the question is, is it a brain cell or a kidney cell? Is it gasoline or kerosene? That's the platform, that's the foundation for all the diseases. So yes, there's a better form of CoQ10 that you can take. Yes, there's different types of vitamin C. Yes, the difference between DMSA and another chelator. Uh, yeah, there's some differences in all that, but the platform to all of it is what we're exposed to and how we live our lives. You keep doing this, and then you try to put something on top of it, you're putting <coughs> icing on a bad cake. Does this make sense to you? That's why everyone needs to read this book, is because it's the foundation, it's the platform. And when you understand this, you change so many things in your life over time. Okay, increased intestinal permeability. And have all of you, uh, who is not quite familiar, and it's okay if you're not, with leaky gut? Okay, a couple people, great, great. So and I'll get to that, I'll, I'll explain it in more detail. Uh, but for right now, it's referred to as intestinal permeability. Increased intestinal permeability is, uh, the underlining is mine, an early biological change that precedes the onset of autoimmune disease. Mrs. Patient, your intestines, your, your digestive tract is a tube. It's about 20, 20 feet long, starts at the mouth, goes to the other end, winds around inside your intestine, you know, inside your gut there. And think of a donut. If you could stretch a donut out, and if you look down the donut, when you swallow food, it's still in the donut. It's in your digestive tract, it's not in your body. It's in the tube. It's gotta go through the walls of the tube to get into the bloodstream, right? And, and so you eat um, vegetables and you want the, the vitamins and minerals from vegetables. Well, it's in the tube. Somehow it's gotta get into the bloodstream. How does that happen? I'll talk about how it happens, but for right now, the inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. So only really small molecules can get through into the bloodstream, right? Think of proteins like a pearl necklace. Hydrochloric acid undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. The enzymes that are produced by your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, your microbiome, those enzymes are scissors that cut the pearl necklace into smaller clumps of the pearl necklace and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you get down to each pearl of the pearl necklace. That's what can go through the cheesecloth to get into the bloodstream. 
and the bigger pieces can't get through until they've been snipped down further and further. That's why you got 25 feet of intestines. One reason is because prime rib takes a whole lot longer to break down than a banana, right? So you got to snip, 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 snip. It's going to take time to break it down so it's small enough to go right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream, and then we can use those amino acids to build new muscle and build new organ tissue and new brain cells. The leaky gut, intestinal permeability, is when you get tears in the cheesecloth. You get tears in the cheesecloth, now in the upper part of the intestines, these bigger molecules, they've been snipped a little bit, but they're still too big, but that's okay, they've got to go down further before they can fit through, no because there's tears in the cheesecloth, now these larger molecules get through the tears in the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. They're called macromolecules, big molecules. And your immune system says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. I better fight this. Now you make antibodies to fight the prime rib, or the chicken, or the couscous, or the oranges or the basil, or whatever the big molecules are that get through the tears in the cheesecloth. When you make the antibodies, I'll use wheat as the example, when you make antibodies to these clumps of wheat that get through into the bloodstream, and you make antibodies to them, the antibodies are primed to go after the signature of wheat. And that signature is amino acid sequence. And the most common one's 33 amino acids long. But I'm just going to say A, A, B, C, D. But I'm referring to that most common one, okay? Now you've got antibodies, and we call them Arnold. Think of Arnold, the governator. <laughs> the governator, he's got his head out of a big Humvee. He's got the dark glasses on, big submachine gun. He's going through the bloodstream, over there, over there. And he's firing these chemical bullets everywhere where he sees A, A, B, C, D. Now... We're all in the bloodstream right now. We're all going this way in the bloodstream. The blood's just a highway. There's trucks on the highway, motorcycles, different kinds of cars, some bicycles that shouldn't be out there on the highway. It's just a highway. So we're all going this way in the bloodstream. Arnold's going along, and there's no lanes of traffic. So Arnold's just bouncing around everywhere, over there, over there, like this, trying to attack A, A, B, C, D. So let's say this wall over here this wall is your thyroid facing the bloodstream. Now, the surface of the thyroid facing the bloodstream, or your brain, or your liver, or your kidneys, doesn't matter. The surface of the thyroid facing the bloodstream is made up of proteins and fats. The proteins are made up of amino acids, hundreds of amino acids long. Part of the sequence of the surface of the thyroid facing the bloodstream includes A, A, B, C, D. Arnold, he's got these glasses on. He can't tell. Oh, oh, over there. And he fires his chemical bullet at the thyroid. He's looking for wheat, but he fires the chemical bullet at the thyroid. This is called molecular mimicry. And I'm giving you a really simplistic view. You know, it's much more technical than that, but this is what it's doing. The antibodies to wheat may attack your thyroid if that's the weak link in your chain. Or it'll attack your brain if that's the weak link in your chain, or it'll attack your muscles, if that's the weak link in your chain. Wherever the weak link is, genetically and antecedents, that's where these antibodies, via molecular mimicry, can attack your tissue. When Arnold attacks your thyroid cell, you damage the thyroid cell. Now you have to make antibodies to get rid of the damaged thyroid cell. So you make thyroid antibodies to get rid of the damaged thyroid cell. That is not a problem unless you have toast for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch, pasta for dinner, bagel for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch, lasagna for dinner, croutons on your salad, a cookie. Every day we have two, three, four exposures to wheat every single day. In this analogy, you have a sensitivity to wheat, Arnold's out there all the time, more antibodies to wheat, more antibodies to wheat, that, that's the weak link in your chain. Arnold goes after thyroid, boom, 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 boom. You make antibodies to get rid of the damaged thyroid cells until eventually this becomes self-perpetuating. Now you develop Hashimoto's thyroid disease because you're killing off your thyroid. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. Much more technical, but this is the world of autoimmunology. 
we now understand the mechanism that's setting this stuff up. That's what the book's about. And it's the platform for almost, as far as I know, every degenerative disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cardiovascular disease, strokes. This is the platform for all of it. That's why this is not just for some people. This is for everybody. Because when you understand this, you say, now wait a minute, that just makes sense. So what can I do to stop throwing gasoline on the fire? What do I have to do for that? And we'll talk a little more about that. When the finely tuned trafficking of these macromolecules is dysregulated, meaning they're not moving further down the tube anymore, being snip, snip, snips. Dysregulated means they're getting through the tears in the cheesecloth. Both intestinal and extra-intestinal autoimmune disorders can occur. And this is from Fasano at Harvard. So this paper changed the world on autoimmunity. This was Melissa Arbuckle at Johns Hopkins, and she published this in 2003. She went and looked for people with lupus at the VA. She found 132 people with lupus in this one VA center. If they're in a VA center, they're veterans. If they're veterans, they were in the armed forces. If they're in the armed forces, they had their blood drawn many times when they're in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. But what people don't know is the government's been saving all of that blood since 1978. They've got tens of millions of samples of our service people's blood. And people don't know that. But Arbuckle went back to the VA and asked for permission to look at the blood of the currently diagnosed lupus patients when they were healthy in the Navy or in the Coast Guard, wherever they were. She got permission. What did she find? She found that these antibodies are present years before the diagnosis of lupus. That means elevated antibodies. The appearance of these antibodies in patients with lupus tends to follow a predictable course with a progressive accumulation of these antibodies before the onset, while the patients feel fine. They don't have any symptoms, but they're killing off tissue. And this was the average was six years before they ever had symptoms, six years, they were already, this is, this is 50% above the limit of normal antibodies. This is double the limit of antibodies, one and a half times. Six years beforehand, most of them nine years beforehand, the antibodies were elevated. And these are the seven different antibodies of lupus. And, you can, and these are all elevated. Anything above zero means more than there should be. Higher, 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 higher. Here are the symptoms when they come five years later in this graph. And then the diagnosis comes within six months to a year later. So the question is, when did they get lupus? They got lupus back here when the antibodies started killing off their tissue, when they got elevated antibodies, slowly killing off the tissue, slowly killing off the tissue, slowly killing off the tissue. Now, everybody has some antibodies to their own tissue. Why? Why is there a normal reference range? Well, it's because... Mrs. Patient, you have a whole new body, an entire new body every seven years. Some cells regenerate very quickly, like the inside lining of your guts every three to five days. Some cells are very slow. Your bone cells are slow. Every seven years, you have a whole new body, right? So how do you make new cells? Well, you got to get rid of the old damaged cells. So when a thyroid cell gets damaged because of Fukushima, which we all got blasted with, you don't know because unless you read the not common press, we all got blasted with Fukushima, right? Damages your thyroid and other tissue. So those damaged thyroid cells have to be replaced. So the immune system makes antibodies to get rid of damaged thyroid cells so you can make new thyroid cells. Antibodies for damaged liver cells so you can make new liver cells. Antibodies for damaged muscle cells so you make new, liver, new muscle cells. So there's a normal reference range. If you do a blood test, you see you've got a normal amount of it. Good, that's fine. That's how it should be. But when you have elevated antibodies, you're killing off more tissue than you're making. Does this make sense to you? So Arbuckle was the first to do this. She went back to the blood banks, and she found, oh my gosh, look at this. And when would we want to address this mechanism? Well, we want to address it. This is Arbuckle's study. She said, you have normal immunity. <clears throat> Here's where you have antibodies to your thyroid. That's normal, or to any tissue. 
but there's a normal amount of them. And now you've got elevated levels, but there's no symptoms. So it's called benign. Now you start getting some symptoms because you've been killing off the tissue, killing off the tissue, killing off the tissue, and then eventually you get diagnosed with the disease. When do you want to diagnose it? When do you want to identify it, right? That's right, way over here. When, right there, right at that line, when they just start elevating, that's when you would want to identify it. And now there are blood tests that you can do that. One blood test, you can look at 24 different tissue antibodies. Six to your brain, four to your heart, four to your gut, two to your thyroid, your liver, your lungs, your bones, your muscles. You can look at 24 different tissue antibodies. The test is about 650 bucks. And you can find out, where am I cooking right now? I did that test and in 1997, because I know the person that, that created the test and it was research only back then. I was 45, still doing triathlons regularly, and scoring in the top 10% of the 30 to 35 year olds. So I was, yeah, I'm, <laughs> right? Feeling really good about that. And so I did this blood test because I was healthy and they called me and they said, Dr. O'Brien, I'm sorry. What do you mean? You have elevated antibodies to myelin basic protein that causes MS, cerebellum, that's the part of the brain that controls muscle movements, why elders can't do this. You know, they just can't move with grace. They can't go up and down the stairs without holding a railing. It's not because their muscles can't do it, it's their brain can't keep balance anymore because your cerebellum's been being killed off for years and years and years. And I also had gangliocyte antibodies, which causes shrinkage of the brain and non-Alzheimer's dementia. I had these three antibodies to my brain elevated. And I said, that's a mistake. I'm healthy. No, it's not. I said, do it again. They said, we did. We know it's you. We did it again. That's when I got religion. That's when I really started studying this. And I said, oh, my God. And Arbuckle study hadn't come out yet. Her study came out in 2003, right? But that's when I started studying this. And I've done that test four times now. They're all gone. Just read the book. You'll learn how to get rid of them. You'll learn what you have to do. So what are the offensive things passing through a permeable intestine? The risk of autoimmune disease increased by 41% with a prior infection-related medical visit. You got a kidney infection? You go to the doctor, you get an antibiotic, your risk of developing an autoimmune disease just went up 41%. You got an ear infection, you got a throat infection, you go to the doctor, your risk of autoimmune disease just went up 41%. Just read the science. This is what they're telling us. The risk of autoimmune disease increased by 90% with a transfusion without infection. So if you got uh, some, somebody else's blood, your risk of developing an autoimmune disease goes up 90%. That's the science. And that's in the Journal of Autoimmunity. That's a first tier journal. Infectious agents have been hypothesized as triggers of autoimmune disease through molecular mimicry. Alterations, so now you understand what molecular mimicry means. Infectious agents, that's bacteria that you were asking about, one of the two of you were asking about. Immune cell activation or infection mediated inflammation. I did this thing, I won't have any time to talk about it. Did anyone see Betrayal, the autoimmune? Oh, yeah. oh, thank you so much, thank you. For those of you that haven't, I spent the last year traveling the globe. I went to Ireland, England, Sweden, Germany, uh, Portugal, Brazil, the US, Canada. I interviewed 85 different world experts on autoimmunity. And the clinicians who are using that information from these researchers and the patients who are doing what the clinicians said to do. So Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld, Tel Aviv University, the guy's the great in the field. I'll give you a taste. 28 of the PhD students who got their PhD studying under him now chair departments of immunology in med schools and hospitals around the world. They're his students. Last April, I interviewed him in Leipzig, Germany at the 10th Annual Autoimmunity Congress. And he had just come out with his book, Vaccines and Autoimmunity. And when you see the interview with him, 
He says, Dr. O'Brien, of course vaccines have saved millions and millions of lives. Of course vaccines do not cause autism. Of course vaccines may cause autism. If the person carries the gene, HLA DRB1, they are very, very vulnerable to developing a reaction to the adjuvant in the vaccine. That's all he'd say. And his book, Vaccines and Autoimmunity, is, I don't know, 14, 18 different articles on that topic. It's a very technical geek book. But, so I interviewed all of these experts, the clinicians who had studied this stuff and began implementing this, and the patients. When you see this woman, tears me up every time. She said, you know, and this is in London. She says, you know, I took the tube to come for this interview. That's the train. I took the tube and I had to walk seven blocks from the station to this hotel. It's not a big deal. And then she teared up and said, but it is. She had wheelchair bound MS. She had eight lesions in her brain. Two years later, she had one lesion left and she had no symptoms. So you hear what the scientists say, you hear what the clinicians say about talking to patients about this, and then you hear the patients who reverse their rheumatoid and reverse their lupus and their Hashimoto's and their MS. That's betrayal. The autoimmune disease secret they're not telling you. I put it out last November, we've had 500,000 people watch it online. It'll be out again in two weeks. And if you would like to see it, just go to my website, thedr.com, and just give us your email address. Just register, and we'll send you the announcement when it comes out. It changes your life when you, when you see this. So it's called a docu-series. So it's nine episodes, each about an hour to an hour and 20 minutes long. And you just sit, you go, oh my god. And when we did the one on the brain, it's like, holy cow. There are five different types of Alzheimer's, we know now, five different types. Type number three is inhalation Alzheimer's. Inhalation Alzheimer's. What does that mean? In 1998, the first studies were published that showed that every single dog in Mexico City has Alzheimer's. Every single dog has evidence of Alzheimer's in their brain. Doesn't matter their age, every single dog. By the end of the 2000s, 2008, 2009, we had the technology to check children. Every single child in Mexico City has early Alzheimer's. Every single child. It's the pollution in the air. You ask about mold? Of course mold can cause Alzheimer's. Of course it can. Because it goes right through, down to the lungs, into the bloodstream, straight up to the brain, and it's an inflammatory, it's gasoline on the fire, and if you have the genes, that's gonna be the reaction you get. Any of you, if you go to, on vacation for a week or two, you come home, you have to air out the house, open the windows, you got mold. Deal with it, get it out of there. There are mold remediation specialists that you can have come in and test your house to see. You find out if you got mold in the house. If you do, you won't like it. It's a pain in the butt because your clothes, your, your bedding, everything. But when you read a couple of the studies or you listen to betrayal and you hear the experts talk about uh, environmental toxicity and air pollution and mold causing Alzheimer's or causing autism, you say, well, this is really important. We have to plan on what we're gonna do here. And you start to change. You can't keep your head buried in the sand. We're killing the planet. We need to wake up to this platform mechanism that's going on and stop trying to find better forms of vitamin C. Stop it. Well, I can still eat my bagels because I have a better form of vitamin C, right? And nobody thinks like that, but that's what we're doing. We're using the logic of the early 80s, taking a probiotic with lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, and then we still drink Coca-Cola. So we kill our guts, we kill off all the good bacteria in our guts, and then we take lactobacillus acidophilus and bifidobacterium, and there are thousands of species of bacteria in your gut. You can't take a pill to replace what you've killed off in the gut. And I don't think I'm gonna to get to how to deal with all that. Um, oh, by the way, I'm gonna give you all the slides. 
Yeah. Every speaker should do that. Every speaker. And I say that on stage now everywhere I go, and the other speakers don't like it at all, right? But uh, and this is with doctors, because doctors don't have time to look up all this, these research. So give them the research. I've already taken the time to get it. So you, you, you guys will get all the slides. And you'll see, because I talk about how do you change all this? How do you start to reverse it? Well, the book does it in great detail, right? But we'll talk about it in there. So um, I'll just move on. Um, endocrine disrupting chemicals contribute substantially to certain forms of disease and disability. My goodness. There is substantial evidence but summarized by the Endocrine Society that the effects of a host of endocrine disrupting chemicals, including bisphenol A. Have, you've all heard of bisphenol A, yes? For those of you that haven't, it's a uh, hardener for plastic. So they, they melt plastic, then they have to get it to take a certain form, and uh, bisphenol A is the chemical they use. It's in water bottles. So anytime you leave your bottle in the car, the sun shines on it, there's bisphenol A in there. So we say, well, I don't get bisphenol A. Oh, really? You go to Starbucks or you go to the coffee shop, you get a plastic lid on there. The heat going, steams up to the underside of the lid and condenses. It drips back down into the coffee full of bisphenol A. You put the coffee cup up to your lips. The hot liquid hits the whole underside of the lid, funnels down through that opening. You get more bisphenol A. Bisphenol A, molecule for molecule, according to the Journal of the American Medical Association, is as potent as the most potent estrogen. And it binds to your estrogen receptor sites. And guys, this is the primary reason these endocrine disrupting chemicals is the primary binding to your estrogen receptor sites. It's the primary reason why men today have one third the testosterone that their grandfathers had. Now, what does that mean? It means you're at high risk of prostate cancer and many other diseases. Now, most women are happy men have one-third the testosterone that they should have, right? Most women are happy about that. But guys, yeah, that's not good. Do not use those plastic lids. So what do you do? You go to the coffee shop with a stainless steel container and say, fill it up, please, right? Do not use saran wrap. It leaks bisphenol A into the, into the food. Do not use Tupperware. You got to stop all this stuff. We think, oh, it's just Tupperware, it's okay. No, it's not. No, it's not. And it doesn't have to be hot. Even cold temperature food, bisphenol A will leak into it. Well, I use bisphenol A free water bottles. Well, yeah, it's because they're using, instead of BPA, they're now doing BPS, which is even a stronger carcinogen. But then they market it as BPA free. It's still plastic. Well, I'm, I'm BPA-free. No, you're not. Now you're getting more BPS. We have to wake up. We really have to wake up. Why do you leave your shoes at the door? Don't come into my house with your shoes. It's not some Zen Buddhist thing. It's that when you walked up to the house, you walked, you know, maybe you parked down the streets, so you walked a couple of houses down. My neighbor sprayed a sidewalk with Roundup yesterday to kill the dandelions. Roundup's on the bottom of your shoes. You walk in the house on the carpet, Roundup's on the carpet. Your kids are on the floor, they get Roundup. The glyphosate on their skin. Infants crawling on the floor, they get Roundup. They get these toxic chemicals you're bringing in from the outside world. You, you have to learn this stuff. I'm sorry, but it's an extremely toxic world. It's killing us. It's killing every mammal on the planet. And it is the environmental trigger, the primary environmental trigger that's causing this rampage of autoimmune diseases. Atherosclerosis, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. They're autoimmune. They're all autoimmune. <laughs> okay, let's see what we've got here. Oh, I'm gonna, I'll just bypass this. This is a guy, um, a case study, 43-year-old man came in and he started losing his hair on his scalp, and on his beard. It's alopecia. It's an autoimmune disease. So um, here's where he, he has a little bit of hair loss in here, and you can see that um, there is no stubble here, as there is here. There's just no stubble. That's an autoimmune disease. He'd never had that before. So they gave him some creams and stuff. It didn't work at all. Then he went to another dermatologist, really smart guy, and in the history, he found out this guy had stomach problems. Yeah, he got a little bloated and stuff. 
So he tested him. The guy had a Heliobacter infection, H. pylori. 50% of the population has H. pylori infections, 50% of you. And so I'm going to bypass all this. But they said, don't, put any, don't take any of the creams anymore. Just take the antibiotics for H. pylori. And when they did that, they, they eliminated the H. pylori within four weeks. They killed it off. So here's the evidence of hair regrowth. So you, there's a little bit coming here. So it got worse in the first four weeks on his scalp, but there's a little bit more here. But it really started to show at eight weeks, 16 weeks. Wait a minute. That's not working right here. OK, I, I don't know why those other ones weren't working. But this is four weeks, eight weeks, 16 weeks, and 44 weeks. Completely reverse the autoimmune disease by killing the bacteria in the gut. So that's what bugs can do, bacteria can do. Completely reverse the autoimmune disease. Why? Because the bacteria was the environmental trigger, the gasoline on the fire, right? So it doesn't matter if it's a food, if it's a bacteria, if it's a yeast, if it's a mold, if it's a fungus. It doesn't matter what the environmental trigger is. Whatever the gasoline is to your body, you have to get it out of there. So we'll skip this about the H. pylori. Oh, I'll just show you what H. pylori has been shown now to cause. Not every case of atrophic gastritis is from H. pylori, but H. pylori will cause this. And chronic gastritis and Hashimoto's thyroid disease and athero uh, atherosclerosis and ar arterial hypertension and unstable angina pectoris as chest pains and ischemic heart disease and Alzheimer's and sclerosis and iron deficiencies, autoimmune pancreatitis, and chronic hives. All of those may be caused by a heliobacter infection that 50% of the world has, right? That means half of us in this room, according to the statistics, have an H. pylori infection right now. OK, with autoimmune diseases, there's the genetics, the diet, infections, and toxic chemicals. This is the package that if there is a gateway, intestinal permeability, you set the stage to begin developing the autoimmune mechanism. What's one identifiable and treatable trigger in the production of antibodies to self? Well, these macromolecules that are getting through into the bloodstream. So in a healthy gut, the macromolecules have to go further down the gut and be snip, 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 snip until they're small enough to go right through the walls of the intestines into the bloodstream. Only the small molecules get through. The big molecules can't get through. But when you've got the leaky gut, tears in the cheesecloth, now these big molecules, wait, 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 oh, that was beef. Oh, you're going to be allergic to beef. No, 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 not chicken. I love chicken. Oh, you're going to be allergic to chicken now. Macromolecules of bananas? Really? I'm allergic to bananas? Are you kidding me, Doc? And this is the person that does a 90 food panel, and they come back sensitive to 20 or 25 different foods. And the person says, oh my god, that's everything I eat. Well, of course it is. Your immune system's protecting you. You don't shut down the immune system. You fix the leaky gut. Wait six months and then check again. And you find now you're sensitive to two foods, maybe three. Does that make sense to you? This is the mechanism of what's going on for people that have many, many food infections or food sensitivities. Can foods trigger pathogenic intestinal permeability? I'm just going to give you one slide. This came from Harvard in 2015. Now, when you break down uh, wheat, the, and you can't break it down to the individual pearls, no human can break down wheat into the pearls of the pearl necklace. No human can. The best we can do is clumps. That's all of us. If you're human, you can't break it down. It doesn't mean it's going to make you sick. There's a whole mechanism that may trigger all that. But every time you eat wheat, the largest macromolecule is called gliden. That's the one that most doctors will check. It's the only one they check, is gliden. Increased intestinal permeability after gliden exposure, after you eat wheat, occurs in all people. Every time you eat toast, you tear the cheesecloth. 
but the fastest growing cells in the body are the inside lining of the gut. So they heals. But then you have a sandwich. Tears a cheesecloth, but it heals. Then you have pasta. Tears a cheesecloth, but it heals. Day after day after day after day until you cross that imaginary line. And it can be when you're two years old, 22 years old, or 92 years old, and you cross that imaginary line, you don't heal anymore. Now you get pathogenic intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, and now the gateway into the development of autoimmune disease begins. That's just the science. You don't like it, I'm sorry. But no human should be eating wheat. That's the science. Because it's more gasoline on the fire for everyone. OK, the gift for you. This is how you get the slides. There's 56 studies I'm talking about here. And 45 of them you get because if they're free to me, they're free to you. But if they weren't free, I can't give them to you for free because that's a copyright violation. So then I give you the link to the abstract. So you go to the doctor.com forward slash SVHI, Silicon Valley Health Institute, and they'll be there for you. But give me a day because my staff don't know yet that they're going to do this. <laughs> I have to send them a message. Probably tomorrow morning I'll do it. So give it a day. So by Saturday, you'll be able to get all the slides. Okay? And... Well, no, it looks much better than that. I don't know why it came out like that, but that's uh, the frame. Uh, that that's what it will look like. OK. OK. Um, I'm not going to talk about how to test for all this stuff. There's no time for that. I'll just give you one case study, and then I have to stop. A 44-year-old guy comes in to see me. His father died at 44 of a massive coronary. His two older brothers died in their early 40s of massive coronaries. He was the last male in the family. He was 28 when his last brother died. And he went to a cardiologist who did tests, said, you're as healthy as a horse, but I'm going to give you a statin just to be safe. So he'd been on a statin now for 16 years. But he's a really smart guy, and he was taking CoQ10 and a bunch of enzymes. Couldn't find any problems, uh, any complications from taking the statin. 16% body fat, healthy guy, exercises regularly. Squeaky clean diet, never eats junk, never. Happy family life, successful businessman. Every doctor tells him, you're the picture of health. But he did the test that I told you about. It looks at 24 different tissue antibodies. All four antibodies to his heart were sky high. Sky high. But he had no symptoms. He had an autoimmune mechanism killing off his heart, but no symptoms. He said, why, why? I said, I don't know. Let's find out. Turns out he was highly sensitive to wheat and to dairy, which were very common in his diet because milk's good for you, build strong bones 12 ways and all that garbage that we were taught, right? Good marketing, really good marketing. So we took wheat and dairy out of his diet. I didn't give him any nutrients. He's already on good nutrients. Waited six months, he came back. His heart antibodies were down to normal, completely down to normal. He said, you saved my life. And I said, well, the scientists that did this work uh, did. Yeah, probably. That's what this work can do for you. When you understand this mechanism, and the tests are on my website, you can see them there. You can download information, take it to your doctor, and say, order this test for me. Order this test for me. It's all there on my website. You can find it. But it's all in the book. It's outlined in the book with lots of examples and all of that. So uh, with that, I'm sorry I've gone over by um, eight minutes. I'm really sorry because we have some other great speakers about to speak. Uh, uh, so uh, you, we have someone raising a hand. So thank you so much. Thank you. So obviously, there's a lot of questions. And uh, we're going to leave it open for questions uh, up until about um, five, t uh, 5 2. And so let me get the. Oh. microphone to you before you start speaking. Two-part question. What's your view of number one, LDA, and number two? LDN? LDA. I don't know what that is. Uh, it's like uh, allergy shots only for IgG um, food sensitivities. Oh, low-dose allergen. Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. And um, secondly, uh, fecal transplants mm -hmm. for a 
What a great Microbiome audience. Microbiome. What a great audience. That yes. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were right. You were right. Um, um, I think that all of us should do, it's called Cyrex array number five. The test is array number five. It looks at 24 different tissue antibodies. I think we all need to do that so you can see right now what's cooking for you. Where, I mean, I was a triathlete in the peak of my career at 45, and I had three elevated in my brain, killing off my brain. So you have to find out what's cooking right now. Then do whatever therapies you want to do. And you may feel better, you may get symptom relief, which is great. But if you don't lower those antibodies, you're killing off your tissue. So there are many great protocols. That's an excellent protocol to desensitize to different foods and environmental exposures. But if you don't, see, you think that if my symptoms are gone, I'm fine. Now you know, years before you ever have symptoms, you're killing off your brain or you're killing off your heart. And it's like in the heart, it's fatal. So uh, there's no therapy that our doctors are doing that I think does not have value. I guess I would say I want to honor if a doctor believes in a particular protocol, it's great to do that, maybe for that person. But you have to have a marker to see, is it fixing what I need to have fixed? So first you have to know, what do I need to have fixed? Well, you've got elevated antibodies, your thyroid. We have to get those down. How am I going to get that down? Well, then you'll learn how to get it down. You'll find the right doctor. But then you go back and check, have the thyroid antibodies come down? If they haven't come down, you may feel better, but you're missing something, right? So don't go by symptoms to determine if you're being successful or not. You need biomarkers. And fecal transplants, fecal transplants are a fabulous idea. We know that you take obese mice and you take the feces from obese mice and you put them into thin mice, the thin mice get obese. And if you take thin mice and you take the feces and you put in the obese mice, the obese mice get thin. So we know that you can have a great impact, but no one knows yet. It's, such, it's, it's in its infancy because there's the whole virome, viruses that nobody's talking about yet. Very few of the scientists are, but when you do fecal transplants, you're also transplanting the viruses that that person has. And nobody knows yet the results of that. Now there's a new test that's about to be launched for your microbiome that's gonna change the face of diagnostics. The way you can learn about the test, my friend Dave Asprey, who runs Bulletproof, Dave does podcasts, and if you watch the podcasts with Naveen Jane, J-A-I-N. It'll drop your jaw as to what's coming. There's 10 offices that'll be offering that test around the country to begin with. I'm one of those offices, Dave's one of them. So uh, when you learn about that particular test, that's the test to do for your microbiome. I think it's, it's called Virex. Uh, I think it's called Virex. The, the company is Virome, Biome. Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, what, oh, I'm sorry, there, there's a guy in the back with the microphone. Take the bull by horns here. Again, um, I want you to, whoever I give the microphone to has the floor. And so I'm going to bring it to you so we can get it on the video, okay? Oh, shit. What is the... Hello? What, uh, what is the role of autophagy in this process? Say that once again. What is the role of autophagy in this process? I don't know how to answer that. Yeah. Sorry. How do you actually know that the gut is healed? I know I'm gluten free, I'm dairy free, I've done everything. How, I take the colostrum every day, I take the collagen every day. How do you know the symptoms? The most sensitive away? test that we have found to identify the status of your gut for intestinal permeability uh, comes from a, uh, uh, a company called Vibrant America, and it's their Wheat Zoomer, Z-O-O-M-E-R, because it includes not only zonulin levels, which the um, um, uh, science is very clear on, um, is the marker of intestinal permeability, but it also includes antibodies to zonulin. Uh, antibodies to zonulin um, to different components of what causes intestinal permeability. So the wheat zoomer test. So you, you do the test, and that's the most sensitive marker that I'm aware of. Hi, thank you for your speech. It was engaging. 
Um, can uh, an autoimmune attack on the liver be misconstrued on an MRI for cancerous growth? Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, what's the exact mechanism uh, behind the pollen allergy? Pollen? Yeah. It's just like any other allergen. If it gets into your system and your immune system says, we got a problem here, if you get these large molecules coming in and your immune system recognizes it as a macromolecule invader, you'll make antibodies to it. That's one mechanism. Mm -hmm. The more common mechanism is a histamine response, an IgE histamine response, so it's not autoimmune but that's your immune system responding and it's more, um, it's called the innate, the more basic response. You get gluten in your system. I have to say, I copy your transcripts and I read them at night and I highlight them. I have been well, following it, you it a long time. It would put me to time. sleep. It would put me to sleep too. So. <laughs> but so I have it all highlighted. Thank you so much. What I, I know you have a product. If you could mention the product that you take, that we could take. Um, you mentioned take five fifty thousand vitamin D, uh, um, advocated charcoal. What can we take if we get gluten in our system if we're in a restaurant? Uh, uh, sure. The first thing is uh, granulated charcoal, fifty thousand units of vitamin D a day, at least for a week. Uh, charcoal at least once, twice a day away from food to absorb as much of these toxins as you can get out. A lot of water, a whole lot of water, just flush, flush, flush. And if you have uh, responses, any symptomatic responses, address those. Also, um, I use Wobenzyme a lot for acute exposures. Wobenzyme, W-O-B-E-N-Z-Y-M. It's proteolytic enzymes and take 15, at a time, 15 to 20 at a time. They use them in cancer clinics in Europe. These proteolytic enzymes are just fabulous. How much charcoal? How much charcoal? Uh, depending on your body weight, so uh, two to four capsules at a time. I'm sorry, how many, how many times a day? Twice, away from food. My product? Oh, the E3 Advanced Plus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, di that, that's the enzymes that break down. We, we all get exposed to gluten every day, even when you're meticulous about being gluten-free because of contamination issues. We all get it. And so anytime you're going to eat anything that in the remotest sense may have the possibility of having gluten in it, like quinoa. Quinoa is safe for you, right? No. They looked at 15 cultivars of quinoa, and four of them had toxic levels of gluten. There's no gluten in quinoa. Well, yes, there is. Four of the 15, well, how, but, but quinoa grows in Peru. No, it grows in the U.S. No, 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 it grows in Peru up at the altitude. No, it grows in the U.S. Farmers crossbred the uh, quinoa that grows in Peru with the grasses in the Midwest, and they created a new plant. And that plant has gluten in it. So you buy quinoa, and it may have toxic gluten in it, depending on where the quinoa is from. So that's why anytime you eat anything that may have exposure to wheat, you take the enzymes, the digestive enzymes. These are the only enzymes that we have found on the market that digest 99% of any wheat that you're exposed to within 60 minutes. And that's really critical, is the 60 minutes before the food gets out of the stomach. Before you go to the restaurant, before you eat the food. You know, I'm, uh, um, it's really difficult to give you recommendations without, I mean, if you've got ulcerative colitis and I tell you to take 15 enzymes at a time, I'm in trouble. So it, you know, we, we want to, well, what do I take? What do I take? What you do is you find out what's going on in your platform, which then gives you the information to start moving forward. Um, doctor, I want to ask um, right at this point, um, Regarding your books that are for sale, yes. Um, uh, how can we do this um, where those who want to get them tonight um, can uh, purchase those? I don't know. 
Okay. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with it. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, well, they're here, so uh, I don't know. Uh, this this wasn't handled in advance. This was uh, the, that as an all volunteer organization. <laughs> uh, there was some uh, uh, things that were dropped here. You know so, what? Uh, uh, um, I'll write down the address. Take a book and send a check back to the office. How much? Uh, I don't know. How much are they? What does it say? I don't know. <laughs> Go to Amazon. I don't have the connection. Oh, that's right. There's no connection. Amazon, you get free gifts, though. Say it again. If you buy it through Amazon or Barnes on your website, yeah. there's free gifts. That's right. If you buy it on my website, you, uh, it sends you to Amazon, but then you download a bunch of cool stuff. But if you buy them here because they're here, um, then just go to info at the doctor.com and say, Dr. Brian said I could get all the cool stuff <laughs> because I bought the book here, right? So um, uh, take the book and uh, after I'm done with the q and I'll take a look. Uh, there is the, most books have price tags on them, don't they? $27. dollars No, make it 25 I don't need my two bucks, right? So, it's, so make it 25 you recommend colostrum. Yes. Should you take that? Is that for life, or is that till you reach a well, point? Well, if you talk to Andrew, it is. Um, my friend Andrew Keach was born and raised on a dairy farm in New Zealand. He learned really early, if you don't give these calves colostrum, they die. You can't give them milk. They have to have colostrum or they die, right? And then he learned that humans, when they were sick, if they took colostrum, they got better. So he decided that he was going to devote his life to making the best colostrum in the world. So what did he do? He went to Oxford and got a PhD in mechanical engineering. And I said, Andrew, I get it, man. PhD, Oxford, way to go. High five, way to go. But mechanical engineering, what? And he said, well, Tom, I'm going to make the best colostrum in the world, and no one's doing it. So if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to learn how to build the equipment to do it. So he devoted eight years of his life. His colostrum is head and shoulders, the finest in the world. No cow can have antibiotics 30 days before they calf. So there's no trace of antibiotics. No cow can ever have growth hormone, and they're all grass-fed. No corn, nothing else. They're all grass-fed. Andrew has over 70% of the world's market now on colostrum. And he's just grown and grown and grown. And he just built a new, new facility to um, uh, uh, extract lactoglobulins, which are really good for your immune system. And he's, he's going to do it for baby formula, to really strengthen these babies' formulas. So he built an $18 million facility in Phoenix. And it came in on time, on budget. And it takes three people to run the whole facility. And Andrew can do it from his phone. Anywhere in the world, because he's got cameras in every room. He can see what's going on. He can monitor everything. That's Andrew, and that's his brain. And that's the colostrum that he produces. The colostrum, it's on my website. It's called uh, GI Restore, GI Restore. And if there's only one thing I was going to give, if I was going to take myself only one thing to heal my gut, it would be colostrum. But you'll see in the slides that I've got, like, eight different recommendations for you, fermented vegetables, bone broth, applesauce, and all the studies as to why. It's all in the, in the slides that you'll get. Due to, ti due to time, she had her hand up first. Due to time, um, just uh, this question and final question. Uh, just a quick follow-up on the bone broth. Uh, what if it's what lead, lead uh, is accumulating in the bones and then Lead. Lead. Really good question. Really good question. That's why the only bone broth I recommend is from my friend, uh, Chef Lance. Um, and I'm, I'm checking to see what it's called because he does mail order all over because it's only organic cows. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, bonebroth.com. It's, it's the cleanest, the cleanest, the highest quality bone broth I've ever seen. Do they have certificates? You'll have to ask them. Okay, regarding uh, colostrum, one of the um, your associates that you on, well, Dave, 
makes bulletproof way. Is, does that have the good colostrum in it? What is the No, no. No, it doesn't. Uh, or it may have some traces, but whey protein is not. I thought, he, I thought he reinforced it with colostrum. Oh, I, don't, I don't know. Perhaps he has. I okay. don't know. You just, okay. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's other questions which um, we're going to have to hold to now so that we can stay on time. We're going to take about a five-minute break for uh, restrooms, and um, then we're going to start with our next presentation. And if, if, if anyone wants the book autographed, I'll do that. <laughs>